Good morning, everyone. My name is Chet McGinsey, and I'm so excited to be here to talk to you guys today about shifting ecosystems and power within the electricity markets. I'm a co-founder of the Cornerstone Group. We're a conservative group that's fighting for clean energy around the country, and we believe that free markets are what's going to be able to improve the lives of every single American. And so I'm really excited to talk about the opportunities within electricity markets and what we can see here uh, today. So. Electricity markets. Most people don't think about electricity markets. The reality is, is that most people spend about six minutes out of their entire year thinking about their electricity bill. Because most, and most people, when they think about it, they're thinking about, well, why is my bill so high? But nobody's actually paying attention to what's going on within the electricity markets um, themselves. But it's incredibly important in these electricity markets. In the top 20 electrical utilities around the country, they have market caps over $12 billion. Combined in the top 20, it's over $500 billion in terms of uh, their market cap. So these are really huge companies that are employing hundreds and thousands of people around the country. So currently, uh, today, they employ about 800,000, over 800,000 employees. And that's not including generation and all the other aspects of electricity. So that could be even uh, into the millions of consumers. And then you think about the millions of dollars that they're spending every single day on uh, vendors like accounting firms, law firms, uh, contractors. Uh, utility companies have a huge impact on all of our societies. You think about it every single day, the lights in this building, the camera that's recording this, uh, all your cell phones are all powered by electricity. So all of our lives are touched by this industry and this ecosystem. And so I'm, I'm really excited to talk about how we're shifting the ecosystems and power um, within this industry. So most people don't realize it, but elect most electrical utilities in this country are monopolies. And so what that means is that each of these companies has the exclusive right to provide electricity um, to these markets. And that means that they're privately owned companies. They're not government-run companies. They're private companies that have been given rights to be able to, to provide electricity. Um, so in the early 1900s, what we actually saw is it kind of looked a little bit like this. So we actually had free markets in electricity. And so you have these small uh, microgrids around the country. So you go to New York or you go to Chicago uh, in the early 1900s, and you see all these wires. So it's telephone wires, it's telegraph wires, and electrical wires. But what society, what we decided to do was to kind of clean it up. So now it kind of looks more like this. Um, but so what we did in America is we actually made a moral compromise. We uh, compromised on having a free market with electricity in order to have a much more efficient uh, system, um, to have one operator um, build out and provide electricity to everyone. But the trade-off was that we actually had a utility commission that actually regulated how electricity um, uh, was uh, uh, offered to consumers. So the rates for electricity were regulated by, by the commission. But one of the big challenges that we have with how we set up our electricity markets was at the time in the early 1900s, our society harbored a lot of sexist and racist sentiments. So unfortunately, what happened is these companies also grew up to start to reflect a lot of those sentiments. So when you looked at the opportunities for people of color, when you looked at the opportunities um, for women, there weren't the opportunities for women or minorities to own these electrical companies um, that, were, that were given the monopoly power. And they certainly weren't allowed to uh, work within those industries uh, in senior or executive roles. And even as suppliers, we had limited opportunities to be able to um, service uh, the utility industry. So now we have the transformation shift. And this is the exciting opportunity that I'm here to talk to everybody about today, is the ability to transform our electricity markets and make them a more free, make them a more open market, but also it's creating the opportunity to make them a more inclusive market. You see, today what we have in the solar industry is solar's providing a new, dynamic, and amazing technology that's providing consumers the ability to generate their own electricity. And never before in, the, in, in human history have individual consumers had so much power to be able to generate and control their own electricity usage. But now with advents of things like storage, it's also creating really neat and innovative opportunities for consumers to be able to now partner with utilities to actually provide services to the grid, like demand response. And so consumers can actually get earn incomes um, and receive payments from the utilities providing this service to the grid. So it's a real neat and exciting time. And the opportunity is there's all these innovative companies that are coming online now that are providing these different services. And so what we have as an opportunity within our society 
is to now create a culture of inclusiveness into the DNA of these new companies. And that's really exciting, and that's what I want to talk about, about how do we think about doing that? How do we think a little bit differently about diversity and inclusion in this new and evolving space? So personally, within my life, uh, this journey kind of started with uh, Jesse Jackson. So when I was a lawyer at Solar City, um, I got asked to uh, have a meeting with Jesse Jackson. Um, the solar industry wanted to meet with him about some issues that were happening in Arizona. And so I was happy to take, take the meeting and represent the solar industry. And so we had this meeting, and um, we were having the dinner, and I was really excited, actually, because uh, you know when I was meeting Jesse Jackson, I was a bit of a fanboy moment. Here's this iconic civil rights leader who, and I was thinking about the I am somebody speech and the impact that that was going to have, that had on so many communities and so many people and empowered them. But within about two minutes of sitting down at dinner, uh, I kind of snapped out of it because I realized he was scowling and sort of waving his finger at me. And in that moment, I realized that I was representing corporate America. I was, I was representing the face of Elon Musk companies, and he wanted to know what Tesla and what Solar City were doing around diversity and inclusion. And so we had a fantastic meeting and walked away with some great points. And I got to come back with the company and have some conversations. And one of the things that we talked about was how are we going to do better about diversity and inclusion, and how are we going to improve it uh, within Solar City? And so what we decided to do was adopt the Rooney Rule. Uh, it was one of the steps we decided to take. So for those of you who don't know, Dan Rooney, uh, who's seated here, is one of the former owner of the NFL Steelers. And he was the head of the NFL's uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And so one of the things he saw within the NFL was the lack of diversity around the, the country, I mean, within the NFL. And so what he did was implement this rule, which essentially said, for any open um, senior position within the uh, uh, NFL team or the coach or operations, they're going to interview um, a diverse set of candidates. And so what you actually saw as a result of that um, prior to 2003, which is when the rule was implemented, um, you saw it start around 4.5%, but you see the massive increase in creating, the, in creating the opportunity. Again, it wasn't a quota system. It didn't demand that they hired anybody. It simply said that if you, did, if you simply just give people the opportunity to interview, a lot of the most qualified candidates are going to be diverse people. And so what we had at Solar City was the same process, which says that for a VP or above, that we were going to interview women and minority candidates, and we were going to hire the best candidate. And so what you naturally saw was the evolution of more diversity within the industry simply because you were creating greater opportunities for people uh, to get the opportunity to be able to sit down. And so I was really excited in 2017 with Tesla and SolarCity merged um, that what we saw was the continuation of what we were doing at SolarCity. And so now with Tesla in 2017, they hired a chief diversity officer to continue a lot of that great work, which was really exciting. And then we also saw uh, Sunrun, which is a major solar uh, finance company around the country. They also hired a chief diversity officer. So what you're seeing is the larger solar companies are starting to get it as a part of their DNA. They're starting to include diversity and inclusion because it's an important part and factor as we create uh, these new opportunities. Now, one of the challenges I had uh, at Solar City was I, I, I hit a wall in terms of trying to create these opportunities. Now, Solar City was growing fast. Uh, I started we were 6,000 employees. We actually grew to about 10,000 employees uh, uh, a year later. So we're literally hiring like 100 people a week. But I would reach out to all these different groups and organizations and tell them, like, hey, we're hiring like gangbusters. Hey, come on, join. G give us uh, resumes let us, and let people know. But the reality is a lot of organizations had these paywalls. They simply said, hey, are you going to uh, you know, join this group or join this in order to get access to these people? And it's funny because I don't even think that the students or people knew that they were hidden behind these paywalls. So I think that we have to start thinking about things differently um, as we talk about diversity and inclusion and how we create greater opportunities to shift that ecosystems of power. So really quickly, what are some ideas? Number one, uh, change your friend network. So if your friend network looks like this, you're likely to have a certain, right, a certain type of person who you're going to get referrals from and who you're going to hire. right? And change your friend network to this. The more we can do about diversifying our own personal friend networks creates opportunities. We hire people that look like, we hire people that are in our friend networks. That's how we, uh, who we trust or friends of friends who we trust. And so if you're an ally and you want to improve diversity and inclusion within um, organizations around America, start it at home and do it yourself. And then getting outside, against outside the box. Number two is breaking down paywalls. So we have to create, we have to change the way we think about um, engaging with, with industry in terms of diversity and inclusion. Today the system is, hey, you're not diverse, pay more to make yourself uh, more diverse. The reality is, is that when we see that play out in economies, 
If I tried to come to you and sell you a good or service and say, hey, pay more because it's a certain good or service, some people would, but most people wouldn't. In my experience in the solar industry, and when you look at Lyft and, and Uber in terms of uh, writing technology, they're doing a lot of great things and a lot of really good, solid, moral reasons for people to use those services. But the reality is, is that most people go solar and most people are using ride sharing technology because it's cheaper and more convenient. And so when we think about diversity and inclusion, I'm challenging somebody in the audience today or somebody watching um, to create a company and start thinking about this in an innovative way to how do you lower the cost of acquisition for companies. If you can lower the cost of acquisition, so that means that when a company is trying to hire somebody, they have to pay a certain amount of money. Um, it costs them money to, to, to bring on candidates. So if you're able to make that cheaper for companies, but do it in a way that exposes them to a more diverse candidate pool at the same time, you're going to see massive increase in scale. And that's the kind of innovative thinking that we want to do in terms of changing uh, what it looks like within uh, hiring practice within, within these emerging technologies. But in addition, we also want to look at how we change the face of the industry. It's not just about hiring practices. It's also about businesses. So this is a picture of executives at a company called Volt Solar, which is down in uh, Washington, DC. And, and that's a really exciting opportunity about opening up these free markets is that we're now creating new opportunities for women and minority-owned businesses to participate in the electricity industry like never before. And we also see Sunrun, which is an amazing story, which was co-founded by a woman. Now it's a publicly traded company. It operates all around across the country. And Sunrun, from its inception, had inclusion as a part of its DNA. And so when you look at what they're doing around gender inclusion, it's been amazing. And I think that this is a really good example of what the possibilities really can be when we open up the doors and allow for more inclusion within these, within these industries. And lastly, the Public Utilities Commission plays a huge part in this process. They are the ones who oversee the electricity industry, and they are the ones who create the opportunities to open up and make these markets more free and more open. And since we're here in Los Angeles today, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the California Public Utilities Commission, which has been on the forefront of looking at these issues. And just recently, the solar industry um, hosted an event uh, with the CFOs and capital markets executives from all the major solar companies. And they met with the uh, leading uh, Latino and African-American investment banks around the country. And that meeting um, was done um, because a lot of the work that had previously been put in place by the California Public Utilities Commission. And the commissioners actually attended the event. Um, uh, Commissioner Picker and Commissioner Peterman were there and supported the event. And that was so fundamentally important for the for these officials to be committed to this as they look at creating these opportunities for changing the, the, the ecosystem and creating more um, uh, a freer market, but also doing it in a way that's more inclusive and that creates more opportunities. Because as vendors and suppliers, again, there's millions of dollars that are available, and we want to make sure that more women and minority-owned businesses are getting access and opportunities to those. Because again, we want to make th the opportunities available to everybody. And lastly, SIA, which is the trade association uh, for the solar industry has done a fantastic and amazing job um, in trying to move forward in creating a more hospitable uh, environment. The CEO, uh, president of SIA currently is Abby Hopper, who, who's a woman who's been very committed to this issue. Um, I've been proud to uh, chair the SIA's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and then also the work that they've done on women has been an amazing opportunity. So, so in conclusion, what I wanted to say today is that you know, the opportunities to create free markets are at the cornerstone of our fabric of our society. Um, we know that free markets create more uh, innovation and are better for consumers overall. So we want to continue to push that. But we can do it in a way and at the same time create opportunities and inclusion for everybody. And it's not a Democrat or Republican issue. It's not a red or a blue issue. It's a purple issue. So we can all do it together in, in a bipartisan way. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you.